Jay David Spurlock. I'm joined by Bob Wycheck and Larry Hama, uh, both of whom work with Wood. And um, I haven't made any notes. I could talk about Woody forever. So I, I just thought we'd just kind of just, you know, do it free form. But I want to say I'm, I'm particularly happy to do this panel with Larry. Larry's, uh, you know, own career at Marvel and as a writer and a creator, you know, he's, he's got quite the resume, G.I. Joe and so much more that, uh, you know, to get to go back to, to the, the beginning, you know, in your time with uh, Woody, I'm, I'm interested in hear about myself. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to start with, uh, with Larry. What can you tell us about how you first connected with Woody? Actually, I, I first met him in the 60s, um, the 64, 65. Um, met him through Larry Ike, who was a, a fan who put out a, a, a Monsters and Heroes. Program. Yeah, Larry Ike is Monsters and Heroes. Right? He, he's also, I think, the first art director of Castle Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. and he, very active in the uh, late 50s and early 60s. And um, uh, my friend J.D. Smith uh, called me over to Larry Ivy. I, mean, uh, I went to the High School of Art and Design in Manhattan, uh, where it was the alma mater of all of A lot of people, a huge amount of people from the comics and industry, including Neil Adams, and Giovanni, and Neil Cady. In fact, if you go back long enough, I think you'd be looking at uh, uh, French Boyer and Carmine and yeah, you know, absolutely. So, uh, it was my first day at the school. I didn't know a single other person at the school. Was, I'm sitting in the lunchroom and this kid comes up to me and he says, hey, you like comics? And I said, no. <laughs> and, but he was really persistent. And he said, well, you know, I know this guy, you know, Larry Ivy, and he said, you know, uh, he's, a, he's an artist and blah, blah, blah. And who was this you were talking to? This is a guy named J.D. Smith. Oh. He was now a custom knife maker in Boston. Um, and he sells, makes art knives. He's a blacksmith. Mm -hmm. But he was a terrific artist. He was like one of the best comic book guys in the school. And he didn't go into comics. Mm. Pretty amazing. But he hauled me over to Larry Ivey's. And Larry Ivey had, you know, like Frazetta stuff, and he had original. He had one big Frazetta original. He had Cal, he had a whole bunch of Cal Fosters. He had uh, hand-bound volumes of like Reed Crandall Blackhawks. He had all these these early uh, Hal Foster Prince Valiants. You know, I, I sort of got, that's how I got to the book, into it. And he lived um, a block from the Museum of Natural History, uh, which was a neighborhood where a lot of comic book artists lived. Uh, Wally Wood did like three blocks away. Uh, Williamson lived in there. Um, uh, there must have been a dozen guys in that neighborhood. And everybody was just sort of like going to visit each other. And that's how I first met Wally Wood. 64. I'm uh, 64, 65. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that was that was quite a transitional period for him. Right. He, and I want to cite, I mean, Wood first came to major acclaim at EC Comics, uh, circa, he'd, he'd actually been there early on with, Her, uh, with the Harry Harrison, who was his uh, partner early on. Both of those guys had come out of School of Visual Arts when he was known as cartoonist and illustrators in the 50s. Uh, Wood was there on the GI Bill and he'd been out of the military in World, World War II and went straight in there. It wasn't there long, but one of the, the quality things about going to school there was not just the education under Hobart and others, but also the people you'd meet. And he ended up working with a lot of people who he met there. Williamson and Frank Cole and uh, Harry Harrison and others. They all called it the Hogarth School. They did. Yeah. Hogarth ran the curriculum and Silas Rose ran the business side. And 
many decades later, Silas kind of bought Hogarth out. And, uh, but so he came to a claim there at EC, Tales from the Crypt, you know, the horror, but also the science fiction. And Harrison and Wood were big science fiction books, and they actually campaigned for games to publish science fiction. So they were very instrumental in the entire science fiction line being published at, at EC. But then after a while, they started doing MAD, and Wood was amazingly equally important at MAD. And he is the only person, and this is very significant to me, I like to, to mention this, the only artist to be in every single issue for the first 10 years of MAD, okay? And uh, it might take a while to discuss some of the details behind the scenes on that, but that's the fact. The only artist in every single issue for the first 10 years. I would argue that he was the star artist. I could give different evidence to back that up, including the first letters that ever came in that actually mentioned an artist, mentioned Wood, things like that. And he was coming in on a high when they first started that. But that, we could do a whole mad panel onto itself. But after some time, for various reasons, there was a stress that was building up at MAD. And he started having these uh, debilitating migraine headaches. Uh, he was trying different you know, medications, nothing was working. Self-medication, again, nothing was working. And he finally figured out that you know, he needed to get out from MAD. The stress really, MAD actually was the stress. Uh, and so right when you're coming in, and this is interesting because uh, I didn't. I didn't realize you had met him so early. And I'm quite uh, happy to hear this because there are very few people that are actually still around that were hanging out with Woody in '64. And that, to me, historically, that's a crucial period. The transition from Mad to Marvel. There was, and right in that little window, this tiny little transitional period. There were a couple of other oddball little things that happened. There was a proposed newspaper strip. Uh, I think it was. I think the proposed title was the week. The week to remember. Uh, later, Woody published it as a portfolio of some of the sample pages. Joan of Arc, you may have seen uh, Cleopatra, uh, Chanel, uh, things like that. Um, oh, fantastic! As, as good as anything he ever did. And then also, you know, the very strange thing was, at Mad, he was being paid. Mad was selling a million copies or more. At their peak, which was actually shortly after Wood left, they sold two million copies. They were selling 10 times what regular comics were selling. He was an absolute superstar at MAD, and then he's coming out to get away from these stressful headaches, going back to traditional comics, where he's getting paid a tiny fraction of what he'd been making at MAD. And a crazy anomaly Anomaly. was anomaly. anomaly. I can get there, it just takes longer than it used to. The, uh, was that he did these couple of little Trompton books out of nowhere. And I really think, uh, I think Russ Jones was involved. Okay. And uh, so that, I'm still trying to clarify some of the details on that. So when you went, do you remember, you went to his house, his studio? Yeah. yeah. Do you was, remember was what he was working on at the time? Well, he, he was doing all his other stuff, too. I mean, he... I think... The galaxy night. Well, it all sort of blends together, you know. But, you know, my friend J.D. Smith, John Smith, um, actually, you know, worked with him at that point. Uh, and then so did Ralph Reese. And this was all... You said Ralph was already there in 64? 60... I think he came, Five or I think he came in at 65, right, yeah. as they're just launching Thunder Eggs. So yeah, so Ralph came in, Wayne Howard was already there. 64, 65? No, 65. Okay. 60. So, and, and then there was some other kid there, too, Tim or something. Uh, was it Tony Coleman? I guess kind of, kind of hazy, but there was a whole, were you smoking anything? <laughs> Were you smoking anything? <laughs> well, no, this was... This is pre-smoke. 50 years ago. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, I mean, I, it could get a blur, because between... The funny thing is, when you look back, you know, 
and study it as a history, it's amazing how quickly things were changing in the 60s. You know, I would say that things, you know, within that one decade, things just kind of moved so fast. So the difference between 64 to 65 alone is a huge difference. 65 to 66 is a huge difference. I think, I mean, things were really moving fast. Now, I was pretty close with Dan Atkins, and he was telling me that in 64, when he came in, Wood didn't really have any assistance, but Wood expanded. Once he got the Thunder Agents game, all of a sudden he started hiring everybody in sight, and including Atkins, uh, there was a guy, Tony Coleman, uh, Ralph, and uh, you know there were other people around. But one of the things I'm really trying to research is who, if anybody, was around before that. Atkins was convinced that, that he was kind of the, about the first to come in. Do you remember Atkins? I think there? Atkins was one of the early guys. Um, you know, the, the guys that sort of stuck around were Atkins and Brown and Ralph and uh, Wayne Howard. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the three I think that were around a lot. Mm -hmm. Then there were people that came and went. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, people don't realize all the people that went through Wood Studio. I, the only thing I can think to compare it to would be continuity. Well, I didn't actually, you know, work for Wood until 71. Mm -hmm. um, I had just gotten out of the Army and uh, I set up with Robert Reese doing stuff. This wasn't enough work to support two of us. So that's how he said. So he called Woody and said, "Hey, can you use somebody to help you scripts?" Mm -hmm. So that was. Were you familiar with Wood before you met him? You said you weren't that into college. Oh, I know. You know yeah, it was uh, for Matt. Okay. Uh, and then when I met Larry Ivy, you know, that's when I got the refresh of to all the, uh, the EC stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Bob, how did you first uh, either become aware of which work, whether you fell in love with it or hated it, or, or actually... <laughs> I don't think I would ever hate what you know. Can you hear me okay? No, I don't want to make any presumptions. No, no, no. I, I just, I, he was one of those artists that, I like Kirby and Ditko and a lot of others, I just fell in love with fell in love with when I saw it. Especially, and I was introduced to Woody's work book, uh, by finding his Daredevil issues. I, I, really, really, I really think it's very significant that you compared him with Kirby Dicko, because I really see those three guys, specifically yes. those three guys, as the key guys of the the early to mid-60s. Yes. Things changed after Wood left Marvel and went over to do Thunder Agents. Stan tracked down a couple of his old favorites, Romita and Sema brought them back, and then Zrango came in and things were changing a lot. But in the early to mid-60s, when Marvel was first really coming into their own, Kirby did go to Wood. Right, exactly. And um, when I actually, you know, I was a continuity associate. I started there in the summer of 74 when I got out of the School of Digital Arts. And I, in the School of Digital Arts, I was taught by uh, Will Eisner and Harvey Kurtzman in my third year. Which was interesting, this is a, as a little side note here. The, uh, the first two years of the School of Digital Arts was a little bit disappointing because they didn't have sequential artists or any kind of comic book artists teaching anything about comic art or storytelling. So a whole bunch of us got together and got together, uh, a lot of students, and we just went up to the uh, administrator's office and says, you have to get people that, you know, this used to be a, a school for comic book artists, you know, for, for, and they finally got Kaiser and Kurtzman as teachers that next year, so that kind of got the music flowing, you know, for having them as teachers. But I got a chance, I, I knew Mike Kaluta very well at these uh, different conventions I would go to, and uh, he and I became uh, not close friends, but good, good acquaintances. And I had seen him, uh, shown him some of my work. He was actually, uh, I went up to his apartment. He knew, I knew where he lived and, you know, keep in touch. And I brought over some work of mine, and he was just finishing a shadow cover, which was amazing to watch him just finishing up this cover that he had to bring over to DC that day. So he says, well, why don't you come up to uh, Continuity, and we'll, you know, I want you to go up to DC, we'll see if you can know, get me some work. So they didn't want me. That's right. That's the thing, that goes, hey, that's, that goes with, you know, the territory. So uh, then he brought me up and he says, and Kalu says, let's go up to continuity. I said, okay. 
brought me up to continuity, and uh, you know, Neil uh, looked at my work, uh, saw, thought my pencil was atrocious, which it was, and, but he liked my ink work. So he said, do these pieces over again and come and come back. So I did, and he hired me as a, one of the crusty bunkers, which is, uh, Larry was part of it, Ralph Reese. I mean, anybody who was there was a crusty bunker, even Russ Heath. Terry Austin, uh, Joe Rubenstein, Bob McLeod, uh, does anybody else have anything out? You can uh, put them in there. Marshall, Marshall Rogers, yes. Uh, Jack Abel worked up there. Now, Jack, the Jack Abel is the good in intro here. The Jack, Jack, right. And Jack Abel and uh, Wally Wood were very good friends, and then Wally Wood would come up and uh, shoot the breeze with Jack many, many times. But actually, it was you, Larry, uh, that I, how I got in touch with Woody was, one, uh, I think it was about, uh, Late, 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 late in the afternoon, and all of a sudden Larry's walking up and down constantly. He says, anybody here can uh, help uh, Woody out on a job? So I, I heard him say that, and I said, I said, Larry, what, what, what's it all about? He says, yeah, he needs you to, uh, you know, to work on some backgrounds, you know, outline backgrounds, because it has to look like Woody stuff, so. And I was just starting out as an crusty bunker, so I figured that's, you know, to work with Woody would be a great, you know, great opportunity. So he gave me the address, I went up there, and here I am knocking on the wood. A little nervous, I'm knocking, knocking on his door. And he, he opened it, he goes, you're Bob, right? Oh, yes. He goes, Bob, I walked in, so. Uh, I says, hey, you don't have to introduce yourself, Mr. Wood. He goes, no, no, I'm not Mr. Wood, I'm Woody. That's what he meant. He definitively made sure he said, I had to call him Mr. Wood. Not oh, Wally. Yes. <laughs> no, I never, never would have called another subject. Yes, yes, I would never, I would never, I would, never, I would, be happy I would never have called him Wally. <laughs> never, never. Well, I had seen Woody, the first time I met Woody was at a comedy convention. I think it was either 68 or 69. Uh, he was just sitting there, and I went up to him and asked for a sketch and spoke to him for a few moments. And uh, he was very interested to talk to, just, just, just a very quiet man. But anyway, so here he is, you know, so I walk into his apartment, and he says, well, listen, I have this job that I'm, I'd like you to help me on, some outlines, some backgrounds. And he shows me the pages, and they're Steve Ditko pages. So I'm looking at him, uh, 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 yeah, I'm saying, here I am working with, I'm going to be working with Wally Wood and I'm inking Steve Ditko for the first time. <laughs> so I was a little bit nervous, but Woody made me feel very relaxed, he was very friendly. What, what script was it? It was The Stalker. Like, it was written by Paul Bettis. Uh, it was, yeah. I think it ran for about five or six issues. Four issues. Four issues, okay. But they, they were great. Right? Yeah, oh, yeah, they're great. I always loved the way movies. And I think, uh, yeah, the backgrounds were fabulous. I'll never forget those backgrounds. Yeah. I think uh, Orlando was the name of the editor. Either Paul or Orlando. Well, I, I think Paul, I think Paul wrote, wrote, I think Paul wrote. Writing and editing. Yeah. So uh, Woody would sit at one end of his, at his table. He had an extra table there. And I'd be sitting there, and I'd be, he'd show me what he, want, what he wanted. So I started just outlining backgrounds here and there. And or one time I was thinking this rope that the stalker was uh, climbing, into, climbing into this tower, and he had this long rope, so I just started thinking it, and he came over and looked at it, he goes, you know, I wasn't going to do that, I'm glad you did that. <laughs> I, okay, that's great, but that's, you know, that's, I, I, anything, you know, anything you know, he said, you know. Something Woody would do when yeah. I was sitting there noodling too much, spending too much time in the background, walk over and stand behind me and say, is it art yet? <laughs> <laughs> That's good, I like that one. Just invite him to tell me that, you know. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't linger and noodle. Which is, you know, because he had these signs up, you know, famous, uh, don't, Right. Don't, don't never, never, never draw what you can copy. Yeah. Never copy what you can trace. Never trace what you can paste up. But he ignored it himself. Yeah. You know, maybe. I think part of that was him trying to police his own. A lot of that was yeah. trying to police his own tendency to right. overdo right. Which, you know, I always thought was compensation. You know, because he's always beating himself up. About not being as good. Because he was holding himself up. As I mean, good or successful? I think at a point. Good. You know, because he had, he had real insecurities about his actual drawing. Mm -hmm. You know, like he would just say, like, you know, look at Williamson. He can just. A know. lot of times he would. And the funny thing is, Williamson idolized Wood. Right. But, but, but Wood. 
could recognize his weakness. And right. he could spot it like Rosetta or Waves, and he's like, oh, look at those Waves and boots, or look right. at how Frank twists the body, right. you know. So, but a lot of artists, you know, you have to learn to see the way you sit to deal with it. But does he, you know, does, they, they come from two different schools. I call it uh, structuralism and gesturalism. You know, like Williamson and Rosetta were very gestural, you know, and Hollywood, all this was, and guys like Bill Kane, and even uh, uh, Hogarth were very constructionists. You know, they worked for constructing figures. Um, and I think Woody was always sort of envious of like the really purely gestural guys because they could do this the like, place. Well then, uh, I forget the issue number, but there's the cover of Rosetta did, famous Bunny's cover. It's got the porthole and the monster coming through the porthole. Well, that's Frank's tribute to Wood, but at the same time, he's teasing Wood. So he does this totally Wood-esque science fiction interior, but he, if you look at those figures, he's got them warped and like, twisted up because he's like, I'm going to get Wood because he can't do things like that. <laughs> but I mean, part of that I think goes into the wood was in, a, in an odd position, kind of halfway. He could bridge realism and cartoon better than practically anybody. You know, most people are better excel in one or the other. And some people would argue Nick Meglin, but then Nick Meglin was within Mad. He would argue that Mad was Wood's best stuff. Maybe it was. You know, I think I was a prisoner of the mechanics of it. You know, because of how he developed his rendering style. Very sort of solid, uh, with, with lots of you know, dense black. I know it's, it's like a quarter to uh, a, a third of Wally Whitburn is black. Yeah, I heard another Woodism. I, I like to call it Woodism. Was uh, he, he told someone, you know, they were asking him, you know, should I put more black? And he says, yes. Put everything that can be black, make it black, and then after that, make a few other things black, too. <laughs> and then he also so he say, wet it down, right? black it out. <laughs> In fact, I was critiquing a friend of mine critiquing a Franco drawing while ago, and he said, oh, it's a great composition, but this line work doesn't work. He needs to black it out like wood would do, like Daredevil's not. I want to I say, this: we're in a landmark year here. This is uh, our 50th anniversary of 65, which is a real key year for Wood. That's really the year where he came to superheroes. He came in at the golden age, but right as the superheroes were dying, and people were experimenting with all these other genres, and he did all the other genres, and he mastered all the other. He could do romance, he could do western, he could do war, he could do science fiction, he could do horror, he could do humor, he could do anything. Uh, but he came in just at the end of that original superhero film, Golden Age film. So when he came back to comic books, he'd been out with Mad Magazine, Galaxy Magazine, paperback book covers, uh, uh, illustrations for advertising, things like that. He was really out of comics, with the exception of he got a call from Jack Kirby to do the Skymaster's newspaper strip. And in those days, all the comic book artists, there are their dreams were to be a newspaper strip artist. That was, that was the, the pinnacle. And so not only did he want to do a newspaper strip, but he also had a fabulous uh, uh, love for Jack Kirby's work. That there were a great mutual admiration society there. And so when they did the Sky Masters, which was newspaper strips, not comic books, then the DC editor says, oh, he's inking your stuff over in a strip. Maybe we can get him on Challengers, and they did. So that was kind of the beginning of coming back to comics, but then the real coming back was when he left Mad and he came over to Marvel to do uh, Daredevil. But so 65, 64, he leaves Mad, he comes to Marvel, he takes over Daredevil with the black and yellow costume. He immediately started changing that costume. The very first issue he did, he changed from a V-neck, they had a single D on Daredevil's belt in a V-neck, he changed it to a round collar so he could raise the D to the chest and made it a double D. So anytime you see a double D logo, that's Wood's logo. He created it. And then within just a couple of issues, he, he totally redesigned the, uh, he turned it into the red hair now. And um, he added a lot of things. There was a lot of technology, but very quickly the relationship was not going well with Stanley. And one key situation was 
the, the quote marble method unquote, where the artists were doing a, a large amount of the plotting. And I've got direct quotes from Wood where he's saying, you know, Stan was supposed to be writing, he'd call me in for a story conference, but he didn't have any ideas, and would sit there staring at each other until I came up with a, a full story. And, and Stan, would, once he got the art in, then he'd tweak the dialogue, uh, things like that. But he wasn't getting paid for the writing there, and he, he was pushing Stan on. He's like, look, I'm doing this extra work, I should be paid for it. And finally Stan says, if you do, if you write every word, then I'll give you writing credit, writing credit. So one issue he does, do that, but before, it's a two-issue story. He does the first issue, I think it was issue uh, 10. And, uh, but then he makes the deal at Tower, where he's got almost total creative control uh, to do a whole line of, of new superhero books for them, which became the Thunder Ages. And so he left Marvel, he gave his notice. And it stands like, he kind of left Stan holding the bag. Stan had to write the end of that story in issue 11. And Stan kind of made a, a deal about that. You can tell there was tension there. If you read the letters pages in those issues, you can kind of see the, the change and the, the uh, kind of almost behind between the lines and like little bitty editorial comments that there were, there were problems there. Um, and then he goes over, so, but all of 65 is the change to the red costume in 65, and then he creates Thunder Age. So that's a big, that's like the biggest superhero year of Woody's career in 65. And of course now Thunder Age has lasted through 69, um, but, uh, but 65 has a huge so you were saying you came back and started working with him, helping writing? Yeah, writing and doing the Reference tracing? What he called swipeography. Yeah. Um, and he had an autograph. He built his own. Yeah. Well, no, it was a store bar. It was a store bar. Uh, it was, but it had a lot of custom features to it. And he had filing cabinets full of preference. We had one cabinet just for airplanes. Now, what what percentage would you say was photography, and what percentage were like uh, like old age comics or other artists? Well, lots of times, you know, for odd angles of heads, it was like Alex Kirby heads. Mm -hmm. So he had this whole file of you know, uh, Raymond Kirby's. Uh, he had. Um, That's awesome. The heart of Juliet Jones. Um, but he, Stan Drake? Yeah, the Stan Drake part of Juliet Jones, but he didn't have the English versions. He, you know, he they had reprinted them in Spanish. So, like, for years, I, I, I didn't realize that it was the heart of Juliet Jones. I, I just thought it was like the, the Spanish guy used to be the El Coro de Juliet de Jones. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was great stuff. He, he, the thing about swipe is you gotta have quality swipe. And then but I should clear the air on that as to what he considers swipe and what the use of it is. You know, because uh, I would you know take a, uh, a, a rip curvy head and swipe it back and down, like in blue pencil. Just the basic structure of the head. Uh, so you get the tilt, you get the, the angle of the ear, you get the really hard to It's like at least a three-quarter shot at the right, right, right. And uh, just get that basic stuff down there. You know, what, what, what he wanted from his assistants or from the guys helping him is to draw a basic human figure in good proportion. That's all Neil Adams was asking. Because if you draw that figure that was like eight heads, heads tall and get some good gesture into it. Once Woody inked it, it was Woody. Right. You know, same thing with Neil. You know, he, he, had, he had five or six different guys right. penciling. He's literally so just looking to save some time. Right. And once Neil inked it, those five different you know pencil guys turned into Neil. You know, and uh, sometimes Ralph and I would be working there simultaneously and stuff, and, and we just put down the basic stuff and 
what do you think that that was the magic? Right. There, it was 90% of Woody was, was revealed in his, and his choice. I like the word magic. There's something about his style, whether, whether it's the early over-rendered, uh, there's, there's a term, uh, what's it? beautiful, beautiful clutter. And it's been uh, referred to as his early like the EC work where he put, I actually saw a quote recently Somebody asked him, you know, he didn't do a lot of interviews, so I kind of like collecting every possible interview. I saw one recently where somebody asked him about his early EC work, why it was so so busy. And he actually said, well, you know, I had just gotten married, but we really weren't doing anything, so I was kind of frustrated with putting all my energy into your work. <laughs> so that was his explanation why, I mean, and later, he really felt like, the word that's used a lot is streamlined, that when he came back to comics, coming from $200 a page of bad to $35, $40 a page back in traditional comics, you know, he was looking to streamline. But, you know, I used to talk to Alex Toad, and he was like, I didn't like that clutter stuff. And Alex, in, in Alex's mind, and I agree, he says, if you can draw a, a believable drawing in five strokes, that takes a greater sophistication and knowledge than to do a believable drawing in 500 strokes. And so, Alex definitely liked Woody. That always bothered Woody. I mean, I remember Woody getting the, the, the newspaper and, and, and opening it up to peanuts. And he'd sit there and look at it. And he'd say, that damn Schultz. And he'd count the, the number of, of strokes. And he'd say, 27 strokes. <laughs> and Schultz is getting away with murder. <laughs> right. And then the, the, the PS to resist all of that is one day he opened his paper and it was the, the month that uh, Chester Gould was doing this script within a script with Dick Tracy. And it was, it was like dots or something. I mean, just little dots. <laughs> <laughs> this guy top Schultz. Yeah. <laughs> they got away with a whole panel that was just like a row of tiny dots. In one interview, they said, if you had it all to do over again, what would you do different? He said, I would have started out drawing like Schultz. Because <laughs> <laughs> everybody, he would always have to answer to the EC thing. And he drove, I saw I think it was Frank Warren, was telling me about the first time he met Woody. And he said, he stuck his foot in his mouth. He said the taboo thing. Oh, I'm a big fan of your EC work. That doesn't that doesn't start the conversation with him. No, because that is, that just reminded him of the fact that he super detailed himself into a corner. You know that people expect it. Yeah. Once you you set that bar, you know, you're sort of stuck with it. You know, you can't you can't decide, well I'm gonna become Alex Toast. But again, he could have, because the magic was in his choice. You know,